In the show Boy Meets World, there's this guy, Eric. He's the older brother of the main character of the show, Corey. Over the course of seven seasons of Boy Meets World, Eric evolves from being a fairly ordinary teenager to an absolute lunatic of a man who barely seems to exist in the same rational universe as the rest of the characters. <laughs> I quit. There are a few fan theories about why this change happened. One cool one is the idea that the show is told mostly from Corey's perspective. So when he's a young kid, he sees his big brother as this cool hip guy he looks up to. But as they get older, his perspective changes and I guess he starts to see him for what he really is which is apparently a big old dum-dum. In reality, Michael Jacobs, the creator of Boy Meets World, probably thought Eric was a little boring at first, and I tend to agree. His only character trait for the first two seasons is that he's really horny. So Jacobs most likely worked with Will Friedle, the actor who plays Eric, to revamp this character, make him more interesting, and get more laughs. Which worked, by the way. Eric is easily the funniest character on the show by the time it ends. But I think this change in Eric's character can actually be explained by the in-universe events of the show. And it's actually kind of a sad story. You are a disgrace to this university, to this country, and humanity in general. Wow. <laughs> Hi, I'm T1J. Follow me. So if you're a fan of Boy Meets World, you probably remember Eric as the crazy, not so smart big brother who basically served as the comic relief. And some of you might be thinking, isn't Boy Meets World a situation comedy? Why does it need comic relief? Well, the show is actually quite dramatic, especially in the later seasons. Like, you know that famous scene from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air where Will Smith cries about his shitty dad? And it was like this rare, sad moment in an otherwise lighthearted show. Those type of scenes happened in almost every episode of the last two seasons of Boy Meets World. So Eric was basically the clown that they sent on stage to remind you that you were indeed watching the family comedy block on ABC. But at the beginning of the show, Eric is just a normal teenager. He doesn't have the best grades in school and he's definitely a silly kid, but there's no initial indication of the absolute cartoon level madness that he would come to be associated with. Eric, get some sleep. You've been up for days. Your scores keep falling. At this rate, you couldn't get into clown college. Is that a four-year school? <laughs> Initially, we pretty much only see Eric when he's interacting with his brother, Corey. Which makes sense. Corey is the boy in Boy Meets World. Most of the show is from his point of view. Eric is two or three or four years older than Corey, depending on the episode. Before the streaming era, TV shows were really fast and loose with their continuity. So there's a lot of things that don't match up, but we're gonna ignore most of that. But what we do learn about Eric is that he has typical teenager anxieties, but generally a kind heart and a good head on his shoulders. He goes to school, he has a best friend named Jason, he's generally well behaved, he even has a part-time job working at his dad's grocery store. If Eric does have a defining characteristic though, it's definitely, as I said, his obsession with girls. This is basically the source of all Eric-related comedy in the first couple seasons. I got a lot of other things in my mind besides girls. A lot of other things. There's like, girl, girl, right there, right there. Where? And he's depicted as being attractive to girls, which I feel like is less funny than if he always struck out with them. But I think he was supposed to be the cool, hip, attractive older brother. I mean, look at that 90s heartthrob hair. Even Topanga, his little brother's girlfriend, is clearly attracted to him, which is something people don't talk about enough. I should go now. So Eric is quite a prolific dater, actually. He is seen with or mentioned as being with like a dozen different girlfriends in just the first two seasons alone. You might think he'd be proud of this, but I think what's really happening happening is none of Eric's relationships seem to last very long. And the thing is, it's very often not even his fault. Eric definitely can be shallow and single-minded when it comes to girls, but he also has a tendency to fall for girls that completely shatter his self-esteem. Like once he dated this girl who was supposed to be tutoring him, but she just wanted to give him all the answers rather than help him learn because she didn't believe that he was smart enough to understand it on his own. I wanted to earn the grade myself, to prove to myself I was smart. 
Why? You've got so much else going for you. Or when he dates this Southern Belle type character who has this very specific old timey Southern accent, like an 1800s plantation owner, and she bosses Eric around and basically turns Eric into her personal slave. Wait a minute, what were they going for here? Do you know my little puff pastry? There's just a lick of winter in the air. Would you mind before picking me up just driving around the block for 40 minutes while the heat is on so the inside of the car is all nice and toasty? Would you do that for me? Say yes, pudding. I think these toxic relationships were the earliest catalyst for Eric's character change. This adding on to the fact that his parents spend most of their mom and dad energy on Corey, mostly because he's the main character, but also because he's at a vulnerable age while Eric is becoming a young adult and should have a couple things figured out by now. So Eric wasn't getting the same level of nurturing and discipline as his other siblings. Yeah, they have a little sister too, her name's Morgan. She's cool, but she's barely in the fucking show. So eventually Eric begins studying for the SAT so he can get into college. This is another thing we learn about Eric is that he really wants to go to college and make something of himself. It's really important to him, but he's having a very difficult and stressful time with the material, which is causing him to freak out a little bit and behave erratically. What's the matter with Eric? Oh, he put his hand on the stove. Again? <laughs> My fault, I left the iron on. <laughs> so? They don't even care. At this point though, we assume that Eric's problems can be chalked up to the stress of the SAT prep. We've never really seen Eric like this before, but this is probably the first couple of episodes where it's like, yo, there might be something wrong with Eric. Oh no, <laughs> my luck. Three days before the SATs, and I'm never even gonna get into, you know, that, that place with the, it's got the, uh, College. College. <laughs> College, you gotta write that down. These are also the episodes where Ben Savage's voice is breaking, which is adorable. Eric's friend, Jason, is helping him study. And if we pay attention to Jason's reaction, we can see that this is not normal for him either. He seems genuinely concerned, but he can't really get through to Eric. Jason is clearly a smart and ambitious kid, and he gets to a point where he's unable to deal with how ridiculous Eric is being, and just straight up goes home. And that's actually the last time we see Jason on Boy Meets World. I think Jason decided that Eric was a lost cause and probably toxic to his own ambitions. Like this absolute doofus is weighing me down and slowly phased himself out of Eric's life. Jason Marsden, who has the same name as the actor who plays him, is one of the only recurring characters that never returned to the show or its spinoff Girl Meets World, even for a cameo. And I can't find any details about why. Marsden got the job to voice Max in a goofy movie around that time, which is a fun fact. So I guess it was busy doing stuff related to that. Boy Meets World, a goofy movie. Gotta love the 90s. All day long I've been watching crimes on TV saw by, by old guys, by fat guys, by guys in wrinkle raincoats. So naturally, it occurs to me, what this world needs is Eric Matthews, good looking detective. <laughs> I talked about how Eric had been struggling in school, but by season three, he's pretty much not trying anymore at all. He's clearly given up on himself, but the way that he expresses it is through goofs and hijinks, and no one around him seems to understand that it's a cry for help. Oh, Mr. Matthews, very interesting essay on Joan of Arc. Ah, finally a little appreciation. Now, did that hurt? <laughs> I doubt if Arc meant that Joan was from Arkansas. It's a theory. It's played for comedy, of course, but it's actually kind of sad if you think about it like this. Eric has no close friends left, no serious romantic prospects. His brother's getting laid now, so he doesn't hang out with him anymore. Actually, that's not true. There's a whole episode four seasons later about Corey and Topanga having sex for the first time. And it feels kind of creepy to mention that. But anyway, on top of all that, neither Eric's teachers nor parents seem to take him very seriously either. I left the iron on. I think that's why he started acting out. He yearns for attention, so he's constantly goofing off. Eventually, Eric is finally about to graduate high school, and he's clearly anxious about his future. As I said, he genuinely wants to get into college. He mentions it several times, but because of his poor grades and lack of direction, he doesn't really believe in himself, so he doesn't try very hard. And predictably, but still disappointingly, Eric's fears come true. I didn't get in. What? 
They rejected me. It's my mistake thinking I could slack off for three and a half years, work hard for two months and get in. Oh. Man, I really wanted to go to college. The first episode of season four is one of my favorite episodes. Eric decides to take a summer road trip with his brother Corey to take his mind off of his recent disappointments. They make a stop in a small country town and Eric immediately becomes obsessed with the simple rural life. Rural. Rural. That's the worst word in the English language. Compared to back home in the city where Eric feels like a failure, the wide-eyed country folks make Eric feel impressive and important and he wants to stay there forever. You're a real smart young man, Eric. You think so? Why, sure. Uh, now, certainly a man of the world like yourself feels more at ease in the big city, but a guy like you could do pretty well in a town like ours. And I'm sure this helped too. But with the help of his family, Eric realizes that he's a fucking teenager and he probably shouldn't leave his support system and settle for the first thing that seems comfortable. One very notable thing though is that Eric is totally normal throughout this episode. I mean, he's still silly, but he was always silly. He actually seems like a thoughtful, articulate person for the first time in a while. Just because I've been made wiser by my experience on the open road, that doesn't make me any better than you. You know, the people that know me, I'm just plain simple. I think at that highway stop in the middle of nowhere, he had finally found an environment where he felt respected and genuinely listened to, possibly for the first time ever. And unfortunately, the very moment Eric gets back home, he reverts right back into the lazy, goofy bozo who doesn't take anything seriously because he's depressed about his unsatisfying life. He's at least able to get a decent job for a little while, helping his dad start a new business, but this pretty much fell into his lap because his father needed some help. He did nothing to earn this job. And it's not his dream either, so he doesn't take it seriously and constantly screws up like he always does. The store they work at is basically like an outdoor supply store, like a miniature Bass Pro Shops. And if you're not from the US and don't know what Bass Pro Shops is, or you've just never been inside one, you should really go check one out. Even if you're not into hunting or camping or anything like that, it's like walking into a museum. It's fascinating. So time goes on and after a few months of running the business, dad, his name's Alan. Eric's father's name is Alan. Alan reaches the breaking point of Eric's irresponsibility and finally fires him. But you're not mad at me. No. Well, you should be. Because as much as you messed up, I messed up even more. I should have fired you. I should have fired you a million times. Dad, Dad, he's up. We're friends. <laughs> I want to know when I started messing up? The day you were born. Alan has finally started to realize the consequences of not paying attention to his son, and it leads to a pretty somber scene because Alan basically tells Eric that he failed to raise him properly. But because you were the firstborn, I loved you differently. I let you get away with stuff. I let you take advantage of me. But I did a lousy job of preparing you for the world that is out there. This probably hurt for Eric to hear, but it also probably was a big relief to have an answer for why his life felt so stagnant, to hear that it wasn't totally his fault, and most importantly, to hear that his father was finally gonna give him the attention and guidance that was missing in the years before. And with this wake up call, as well as long overdue support from the adults in his life, Eric gets a boost of confidence and initiative, and after some effort, finally gets accepted into Pembroke University. And they want you there like a week before Labor Day for some kind of orientation deal. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in! I'm in! I'm in! Seasons five and six are a little bit of an Eric glow up. He's moved out of his parents' house, he's doing well in school, he's made some good friends, and he developed several previously untapped talents. He's a naturally gifted stage actor. Now, Tybalt. Take the villain back again for Mercutio's soul is but a little way above our heads, waiting for thine to keep him company. He's well versed in art history. Neoclassicism, Impressionism, photographic art. Ansel Adams, American landscape, he's probably my favorite. And he saves his roommate Jack from being sacrificed to Satan by a group of witches. A hunter will be sacrificed. Two hunters are even sweeter. <laughs> How about two hunters and a Matthews? Although that last one I think may have been a non-canon Halloween episode. But the point is, Eric is kind of thriving right now. Yeah, college has its challenges and he still messes around here and there like any student, but he's actually beginning to discover his potential.
While working as a department store Santa Claus for some extra holiday cash, Eric meets a young orphan boy named Tommy who is sad because of the whole not having parents thing. Eric is deeply moved by Tommy. Maybe Tommy reminds him of himself, a scared, lost kid looking for someone to hold his hand. So Eric feels a duty to take care of this kid and becomes kind of an unofficial big brother to Tommy. And the two hang out all the time and grow very close to each other. And Tommy is in multiple episodes. It's not one of those things where a character shows up for one episode and then disappears forever. They made us care about this relationship. As you might imagine, given how silly and playful he is, Eric is very good with children. It's been shown a bunch of times throughout the course of the show. But his relationship with Tommy evolves into something very special. Hey, you know, maybe there's something I can do. I would like to adopt Tommy, please. Eric, maybe we should discuss this in my office. I want Eric! I pick Eric! Hey, kids, I'm getting adopted! I'm getting adopted! Yes! This is like the happiest day of my life. <laughs> Now, Eric is a college student with no money, so obviously they didn't let him adopt Tommy. But it's up to Eric to convince Tommy to give another family a chance because Tommy only wants Eric to adopt him. The problem is this family lives on the other side of the country, meaning Eric and Tommy would have to separate forever. So Eric ultimately has to say goodbye to Tommy while breaking Tommy's heart at the same time. Tommy. I'm not going to adopt you. I don't like you anymore. I'm sorry to hear that, Tom. Eric was never the same after that. Eric, I, I don't understand. You said you loved your long hair. You swore you'd never cut it. Well, I didn't just cut it. I had like a religious experience. I had a... a, a, a Deeply meaningful, life-altering metamorphosis. I also got a bikini wax. Check this out. Oh. <laughs> In the final season of Boy Meets World, Eric has completely lost all semblance of reason and seems completely disconnected from reality. In fact, some of the things that we see happen to him are so bizarre that I'm pretty sure they're only happening in his imagination. He has completely dissociated by this point. He has no fear, no compassion. I'm gonna miss you. You're always my favorite. Really? <laughs> and he no longer even seems to care about the consequences of his actions. This is the same guy that recently tried to adopt a child. And that's pretty much how Eric's story ends in Boy Meets World. He moves to New York with his brother in the final episode, but it's kind of decided on a whim. He doesn't have any job prospects. He doesn't have a relationship. He's just kind of leaving. And then the show ends. It's a really sad character arc. The title was not clickbait. All the other characters grow and learn and succeed, and Eric is just a mindless clown. Now, there's a little more to the story, but first I want to address all the people who are wondering why I'm making another video about Boy Meets World when I just did that a few months ago. I promise T1J is not turning into a Boy Meets World channel. This is just a video that I said I would do, but you know, things came up, had some other projects to work on, reactivated my World of Warcraft account. Let's just say some projects got put on hold. I also said I was gonna put this video on Nebula, but I've come to believe that there's really no reason to put a video like this behind a paywall and limit the amount of people that can see it. If you would like to see awesome, well-produced, exclusive videos, you should consider Nebula though. And I'm not talking about Topanga's sister that they mentioned once and then never again for the rest of the series. Don't you mean Debbie? No, Nebby. It's short for Nebula. Nebula stopped the war, Lawrence. I'm talking about Nebula, our video platform. There's so much great content on there that you can't find anywhere else. And it's made by creators you probably already know and love. Literally, go to the Creators tab. I almost guarantee that you'll find several channels that you already watch consistently on YouTube. Which, if you want to watch those videos from me or any of these great creators with no ads or sponsor segments, Nebula's good for that too. The cool thing about joining Nebula is you're not only supporting an organization, you're also supporting independent creators. We literally have ownership in the company. Nebula is also supported by CuriosityStream. And I want to mention CuriosityStream firstly because they're the sponsor of the video and I 
have to if I want them to pay me, but also because we've arranged a genuinely awesome deal where if you go to curiositystream.com slash T1J and sign up for CuriosityStream using my code T1J, you can also get access to Nebula for free. CuriosityStream, if you don't know, is a streaming service that focuses on documentaries and nonfiction titles. There are thousands of them on the site. If you love comedy like me, you can check out the Comedy Legends series, which profiles comedy icons like Eddie Murphy and Goldie Hawn. There's a lot of commentary, criticism, and essay content on Nebula, so I think that meshes well with CuriosityStream. And if you sign up for this deal using my code, you can get 26% off the annual plan, which gets you access to CuriosityStream and Nebula for less than $15 a year. So please go check it out. The link is in the description. Okay, so 15 years after Boy Meets World ended, a spin-off called Girl Meets World began airing. Girl Meets World revolves around Cory and Topanga's tween daughter Riley and her best friend Maya, but also has guest appearances from almost every character from the original show, including Eric. Now, this show is definitely canon, although many fans of Boy Meets World try to pretend that it doesn't exist, mainly because they made Sean marry some white lady instead of Angela. Anyway, we see that after 15 years, Eric seems exactly the same if not worse, he's still completely out of control and barely seems to understand where he is half the time. So his arc on Girl Meets World involves him being chosen by the powers that be to run for senator. They plucked me off the street and they hustled me into a limousine like I was fancy. He came up to me and he was like, Eric, you are the only one that has a chance to defeat Senator Jefferson Davis Graham in the primary. But it turns out the whole thing's a setup. He was only chosen because he's an imbecile and he's just there to make his corrupt opponent look better. I mean, Eric should have known something was up because he's being asked to run for senator when he barely knows how the political process works. I also don't know what a primary is. But this type of thing is why Eric was so aimless and unmotivated as a kid and always looked for something easy and comfortable. Because whenever he actually tried or got invested in something, there was always disappointment. But this this time, Eric is able to overcome the odds when he gets some help from an old friend. But you've been doing this for a very long time, Senator, and we don't see anything getting any better. And no, I don't have kids yet, but I care about them very much. But you can't prove it. But I can. Excuse me? My name is TJ Murphy, Thomas Jonathan Murphy. Eric Matthews once knew me as... Tommy? Hi, Eric. Thank you for watching this video. I'd like to give a shout out to the homies Leslie Coy, Andrew Iden, Kios, and Xavier SJS. Thanks for supporting the channel. I really love Boy Meets World, if you couldn't tell. I did another video about a different arc on Boy Meets World, a link to which should be on the screen as we speak. It's also a sad story, so go check it out if you want. That's the end. Stay Heiko. Bye-bye.